Hey, Jason. How's it going? Great. How are you? Excellent. There we go. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. That's all I'm saying. Hey, I don't see you there, Jason. <laughs> all right. So I love this topic you're going to talk about today. I'm, Excellent. I'm going to be a fly on the wall. Okay. And I, I may pop in at the end with a question or two. Right. So I'll probably um, I'll turn off my own video and you can just go and do your thing. All right. I'm going to fix my... Kind of fix my focus. Yeah, it's a little was a little blurry, but it wasn't horrible. Is that pretty good? It's not bad. Okay. I think it's passable. Great. All right, so I'll start my video and have at it, and um, I'll probably mute myself in case because I've got kiddos off from school around today. So hopefully. <laughs> uh, are you doing an intro, or do I just jump in? Um, you're welcome to just jump in. And okay, I'll uh, I'll chime in. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Hey, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, Amazon's brand registry program, and uh, from an intellectual property attorney's point of view, and kind of how that works, and and what you can do to access it. So one of the one of the big issues facing people who are doing any kind of uh, commerce online is that Amazon has become just this huge monster dominating force in the market. Um, I know that a lot of sellers really don't like Amazon and it's difficult to work with, um, but buyers love Amazon. And, and that's one of the reasons why sellers um, aggregate towards Amazon is because buyers love it so much. It's kind of often one of the first places to get free looks if they want to go buy something. So if you want to be part of that market, then you definitely need to be part of what Amazon's doing. And Amazon is, it has been really aggressive and really successful at doing the kinds of things that sellers like and they want. Um, and that often makes things difficult, sorry, that, what, what buyers want, and that often makes things difficult for sellers. And one of the things that has happened is it's made it difficult for sellers to stop infringement when it's happening. Now this also happens with Alibaba, um, happens with eBay, happens with any kind of on, online aggregate of, of uh, retailers where you end up with lots of issues of infringement and then of course you're going to go to the platform to try to, to solve the problem. And um, so Amazon's brand registry is sort of a way to sort of automate that, make that easier. Um, so frankly, I, I don't like Issuing takedown notices to eBay and Amazon and things like that. It's, not, it's definitely not one of my favorite things to do as an intellectual property attorney. And so I'm definitely in favor of them building tools and creating tools that allow retailers to establish control and dominance of their intellectual property in that space and that do it in a way that the, the retailer can do it um, instead of having to have their lawyers do it. So I, I definitely applaud them in doing this. Now, the brand registry is a very limited, um, it's a very limited scope of intellectual property protection. It only applies for trademark registrations that are in certain set of countries. The United States is one of those countries and they, they have a, if you go to their website that, that talks about um, the details of that and how to do it, the, um, there's a short list of countries where you, if you have a trademark registration in that country, then you can file to get your brand on the registry. Now your brand that's registered has to be either a word mark or a stylized design of a word mark. And so what that means is for example, if Nike, right? So Nike has a trademark registration for the word mark or shoes, they could do that. Um, and if they have Nike with a swoosh above it registered, they could do that. If they just want to protect the swoosh, they can't because it's not words or letters or numbers, it's just a design. And so if your brand that you have registered is just a design, you're not going to be able to register that through the brand registry. And so it really primarily needs to be something that is words, letters, numbers, things like that. 
another thing that, that sometimes will, will trick people or get people tripped up is that my understanding is that Amazon does not accept brands that are on the supplemental register. And the supplemental register is, a, is, is sort of a place to go when your brand is too descriptive um, and they're not willing to put it on the, the primary register, the principal register. And, uh, and so if your trademark is registered on the supplemental register, you're not going to be able to access the brand register. Um, now, you actually have to have a registration. A trademark application is not sufficient. And one of the issues that people will have is that they want to be registered through Amazon's brand registry now because they want the tools that they get from that. Um, yeah, but the problem is, is it takes months for the trademark office to even assign your application to an examiner. Plus there's whole steps in the process to get it registered. And so from the time you start, it may be seven, eight, nine months, 12 months, um, or even longer if you, if you have to fight with the trademark office to get your, your application registered. So it may take you know, nine months to a year to get the registration. Once you have the registration and that registration is published and you have a registration number, then you can apply for the brand registry through Amazon. And you just go online, you apply, and what they'll do is they will, in as you're going through the application process, they will send your attorney an email with a verification code. The verification code, and it's the attorney that's listed on the application for the trademark. That verification code is what you need to continue with the process. And so um, over the past year or so, I've been getting a lot of those. I've been getting just randomly, I'll get an email from Amazon and it's for one of my clients. And then I see which client it's for and then I can go ahead and forward it to them so they can go ahead and complete that process. And, uh, and it's great because it allows my clients to go ahead and have some authority and some control over the, um, what happens on Amazon with respect to their brand. Now, it hasn't been perfect. Uh, Amazon's evolving, and, and there are some other issues that, uh, you know, they've been in the courts recently with, with making it difficult to go after infringers. But um, I, I'm really hopeful that this brand registry pro program will be successful and that they'll expand it and grow it. Um, it would be nice if they could expand it to more than just the, uh, the word marks. I don't know if they'll expand to more than that or not. And then also it's great if they can keep adding countries uh, because this is definitely a world marketplace and it would be good to be able to shut down infringers um, in more than just the list that they have. The, uh, now, as far as, um, as far as the trademark process goes, um, just to give you kind of some background of the trademark process, what you can expect once the application is filed, it takes them about three months to assign it to an examiner. An examiner is the one who looks through the application, does some research, checks to see if you're not stepping on someone else's toes, decides whether they're going to allow it or not. If they're going to allow it, it moves through the allowance process. If they're not going to allow it, they send what's called an office action um, where they just explain why they're not allowing it and what the problems are and sometimes they have suggestions for how to fix it sometimes those suggestions are good sometimes they're not um, but you want to make sure that that you respond to that in time uh, because if you don't then the application goes pan and you can lose the whole thing so you know, be sure to keep on top of that the uh the allowance process if you have already proven that you're using the mark in commerce if you've got goods and services that, that the mark is being used with then you can uh, go straight to publication. Um, they publish the application and basically give everybody in the world a month to decide whether or not they want to oppose your mark before it's, it's registered. If nobody opposes it or, or requests an extension of time to oppose, then it moves to the registration process. And usually about a month after that is when you get the registration certificate and the registration number. Um, if you have not proven that you're using it in commerce, that now is the time to do it. You have about six months from when it's allowed to, to prove that you're using it in commerce. 
And to do that, you've got to submit evidence to them that you're properly using your brand in association with the claimed goods and services. And uh, if you can't do that or aren't ready to do that, there's extensions that can be filed. There are six month extensions. You can file up to five of those in sequence. So you can, you can take you know three years to finally prove that you're using it in commerce. But, um, and that just allows for the realities of entrepreneurialism, which is things sometimes take longer than planned and they don't you know, go, go as planned. And sometimes you have to adjust and make changes. Um, sometimes product development uh, runs into the sticky issues and, and it takes time to go through those. So anyways, once you get the registration, then that's when you can access the Amazon brand registry and uh, and then have those additional powers and, and, and capabilities. Um, I've never seen the user interface for that. I've never been involved in that, but from my understanding is it allows you some easy ways to look for infringers. Um, it also allows you some easy ways to, to uh, basically put those infringers on notice that, that there's a problem and, uh, and get those listings taken down. Amazon says that they act on most of them within about eight hours of you posting the, the issue. And, um, but I've, I've, I've heard of you know, things not going well or things not going as planned with that. So, um, so just kind of expect what you get. The, uh, one of the other issues that you want to be really careful of is using you know, where it makes it really easy to submit something saying that a listing is, is fraudulent or counterfeit. Um, it also makes it kind of easy for you to, to accidentally submit that your own listings are fraudulent or counterfeit. And I've seen that where we've had to fix that before and that has been super hard to fix. So um, just be really careful when you're submitting those that you don't accidentally say that your own listing is a bad listing or a counterfeit listing because once it gets delisted, um, you know, you could have a, a fantastic successful listing that then you have to sort of rebuild all over again from scratch um, if, they, if they're not willing to, to relist it again. So anyways, so that's, that's kind of that in a nutshell. Um, plan on spending anywhere from um, 2500 to 3500 to go through the trademark process, start to finish, including the research, preparing and filing the application, babysitting it through the process, uh, proving that you're using e-commerce, government fees, things like that. Um, there are cheaper ways to do it, but you get what you pay for. One of the, the difficulties with trademark law is that the um, trademark law isn't like doesn't have roots in that are the same as copyright law and patent law. Copyright law and patent law were designed to reward people who brought good things to our society. So, you know, you, you, someone writes a wonderful book, you want to protect that and, and make sure they get rewarded. Someone's a great artist, you want to make sure that the art that they produce, they, they get paid for, it's not stolen from them. Um, someone invents something that makes our lives better, we want to reward that inventor, we want more of those kinds of inventions. Um, whereas for trademark law, it's not designed to protect the merchants, the sellers, it's designed to protect the consuming public. And so um, a lot of people, when they file their own trademark applications or when they go through a cheap service, uh, one of those cheap online services, then um, they make really, they make mistakes in the applications that can ruin the application. And there's only a few things that you can change. And most of the things you can change in your application can only change just a little bit. You're really limited on how much you can change it. So mistakes that you make early in the process of filing your application often can't be fixed later. And so you can waste a lot of time. Um, if you try to go cheap um, or try to file it yourself, you can waste a lot of time that otherwise you could have had great strong protection and useful tools with Amazon brand, re brand registry. So uh, you know, just be really careful if, if you've got a really successful product and, and, um, or you've got a big launch with lots of marketing dollars going into something um, and it really matters, then um, you definitely don't want to take the risk of filing it yourself. Um, I saw a study where they looked at five years of data at the trademark office. Um, and I 
study I saw was probably about three or four years ago. Um, anyways, they took five whole years of data from the trademark office um, and not a sampling of it, like all the data. And what they found was that people who filed their own applications who had filed less than 30 applications previously only had about a 30% chance of getting a registration at all. It didn't look to the quality of those registrations, and I know some of them are severely lacking in quality, um, but they only had a 30% chance of even getting a registration. Um, and so having experience in going through the process and knowing what to avoid and how to not make you know, the, the bad mistakes um, makes a big difference in being able to get that registration. And having that registration makes a big difference in being able to enforce your rights. So anyways, I hope that's helpful. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say on the topic today. Okay. Hey, Jason, thanks so much for that. Um, I didn't understand that history that I think that was one of the marching things for me is that the trademark laws were not designed to protect the registrant or I guess whoever, would you call that the owner of the trademark? Yeah. The, the merchant, the, you know, the person who's selling the merchant or the manufacturer. Um, and it kind of goes back to feudal times um, because these trademark laws are, you know, they're, they're a Western creation. Um, and, and it was basically, you have your noblemen and you have your king and you have your merchants who are the, the craftsmen. And so you have a guy who's making saddles. He makes really great saddles. Noblemen like to buy his saddles because they're really high quality. Someone else wants to sell their saddles but's having a hard time. So they start putting the other guy's mark on their saddles and passing off their saddles as if they're the really good ones. So then the nobleman buys the crappy saddle, thinking it's a good saddle, it breaks, his kid falls off the horse, he's upset, he then goes to who he thinks is the manufacturer, shows him the saddle, says, hey, I'm really upset, you, you, know, you better make this right. And that merchant says, this is not my saddle, I don't use those materials, I don't stitch like that, right? Has all this proof that it wasn't him. That dispute ends up going to the king, the king's job is to deal with these disputes. The king likes the nobleman more than the king likes the merchant. Um, they have a closer relationship. Mm. And so the solution that the king comes up with is, all right, merchant, I will give you exclusive rights to your brand. So not so that you can be protected. It's so that my noblemen don't end up getting confused and buying the wrong stuff. Right? I want my noblemen to be protected. Now, as our culture has evolved over time, the buying public is, you know, the noblemen that are buying from these craftsmen are now the buying public. They're everybody, right? It's the, the right. public. Um, but they're still that protected class. They're still the group that the laws were designed to protect. And so, um, so tra yeah, trademark law treats us all like noblemen and, and treats the merchants like, here, it's your job to protect the consumers. It's not your job to protect what's your property so but that's it's, where a lot of the confusion is but it still is a violation of some sort if a company knocks off your brand your is selling goods under the trademark that you registered yeah yeah without but, permission right yeah but where, where it starts to get confusing is that for example in you know in copyright law or, or patent law, then you have this concept of substantial similarity, right? Of, of is it close enough to what is protected that they've infringed on the rights of the owner of what's protected, right? So you look right. at how close it is, okay? Yep. Um, and But with, with, with trademark law, it's not substantial similarity or a version of that. It's likelihood of confusion. It's it's not how close is it, is, is it close enough that the consuming public would get confused? So it could be identical, right? But if nobody right. would get confused, then the law doesn't care, right? Or it could be pretty different, but if it would still confuse people, then the law says it's not okay, right? And so we're not talking about protecting the owner of the property. That's not the test. The test is, what do we need to do to protect the people who are going to buy? Hmm. And so with Amazon, they created brand registry to try to do this. Is that their mechanism? Uh, I, I, 
so I wasn't in the room when they were making these decisions <laughs> and they're not my clients and right. So yeah. but my guess is that they, I mean, they do a ton of business and they also get a ton of people complaining about copycats and counterfeits. Right. Right. And so I think it's more of a, Hey, we're being flooded with all these demands and we'd like a way to just channel that and automate it so that it costs us less to deal with this part of our business. So they have a responsibility to deal with it because all these people that may be violating trademarks, they're all selling on their platform and consumers, the public, as you say, is being confused. Yeah. They have to play a role. Yeah. And they, with the way that they've set up their business, um, they've done a really good job of shielding themselves from liability. Um, Too good of a job, I think, actually. And, um, and so there's not a whole lot of accountability with them, but it's still a, a tremendous annoyance for them to get all these demands and get all these requests. And so I think they just wanted to just funnel that into something that'll solve itself without them having to do much. So. Makes sense. All right. Well, that sounds like very valuable um, information that you're sharing with everyone today. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Excellent.